really glad you could join us today. So I'm John Hillen, as, as Pia mentioned, I'm the uh, CEO of a mid-sized technology services company, and I've been the CEO uh, of four or five other companies, both public and private. So I've had part of my career as a CEO, um, but I'm in the leadership business. I'm in the institutional leadership business. I've been an assistant secretary of state, uh, running about one sixth of the state department. Um, I've been an army officer, and uh, I've been involved with a lot of nonprofit institutions. So uh, I come to this from the perspective of institutional leadership, a little bit regardless of what sort of business the institution is in. At the end of the day, everything from IBM to a three-person volunteer church choir has one trait in common and that both organizations and everything in between are full of people working together trying to accomplish something. And that dynamic of institutional leadership is, is where I specialize. In between companies, I taught for five years as a full-time faculty member in a business school and I taught leadership and strategy. <clears throat> and so my remarks will stem a little bit from that experience. And, and a book that I co-wrote came out um, about a year and a half ago. Um, Legatus Magazine called it a guide to the interior life for a Catholic business leader, which I, well, I thought was nice. I wish I had thought of that when we were writing it. Um, but it really does speak to this issue. I co-wrote it with another great uh, Catholic leader named Mark Nevins, Dr. Mark Nevins, who's one of the uh, leading American specialists on organizational development and executive development. And what we, what we wrote about was the alignment or misalignment of institutional needs on the one hand and executive competencies and development on the other. And that as institutions grew uh, in uh, the complexity and the sophistication of their mission and the environment around them, the executives did not often grow along with the institution. So the, you know, this, to give you a, a, a small example, the skills of an executive working at the top in a small private company are dramatically different from the exact same title and the exact same role of that executive working in the same position in a large public company. The game has entirely changed. And we found that almost all institutions, public, private, governmental, and we have a lot of case studies in the book, make plans to grow or change. A tiny percentage of those same institutions deliberately and rigorously make plans to grow or change the competencies of their leaders, the executive competencies of the leaders to go along with the growth of the institution. So when I bring it back to the church, and I was the founding chair of the uh, International Business Leaders Advisory Council for the program on church management, and I serve on the board of the Global Institute uh, of Church Management. So I've been involved in this for a bit. And I'm on my parish finance council, right? So from the Vatican through the parish finance council, I've had a chance to view a lot of the bits of the church. And in fact, several bishops hosted me on my book tour to talk about these sort of things. But I'm going to push harder and further on uh, what Father Bob said when he laid down the theological foundations of more lay involvement in governance. And I think by governance, we mean all the facets of oversight, institutional leadership and the management of day-to-day -day things within an institution. All those levels from what we might call management through strategic leadership through to board level oversight. And uh, we, I, I start with a couple of presumptions. One is we have great executive talent at the institutional leadership level among our faithful lay Catholics. Great executive talent. Some of the people I've met at Knapp Institute events and the like absolutely blow me away. The men and women who are committed to the church as lay leaders and the extraordinary range of talents they have, uh, like Mary and Pia and so many others. And uh, this great wide range of life experiences that they can bring to the table in the service of, of the church. So that's one presumption. The second presumption is that the executive development uh, pathway for our, for our clergy is centered, especially as beginning, almost entirely in becoming a great priest. I can't imagine changing that. I don't know why we want to change that. But when you look at it, when you pull back and you look at it from an executive development perspective, we train our priest very hard in the seminary and then in their early years 
to uh, administer the sacraments, assume pastoral responsibilities, and many times not much else. Then there can be different pathways. They may go a scholarly pathway. They go may, may go a, a teaching pathway, an administrative pathway. Most thankfully, as Father Bob said, with the parish being the nucleus of our, of our church and our faith, most go into pastoral responsibilities at the parish uh, level. Um, we don't train them much in administration or management, and that's something our programs that we're involved with at the Global Institute of Church Management are helping to fix. Um, and we kind of, we work through it. Some pastors have terrific administrative instincts, some don't. Um, but either way, we're, we're taking a bit of, as an institution, we're, we're sort of just taking our chances. It's a little bit of a leadership lottery in, in many ways for what we'll get outside of the contrasting, incredibly rigorous training we give our priests and our other religious in theology and philosophy and in administering in the sacraments church, something that cannot be replaced, something that cannot be replaced and has to be fundamental. When you get up to the Episcopal level and the diocesan level, it's a different institution. It's not just a super parish. It's not just a parish on steroids in terms of the institutional challenges that are present to it. It is in an environment in which, you know, a group of small business leaders on the, on the parish finance council are not likely going to have the sophistication for the public relations world the diocese is in, for the strategic institution building world, for the world of looking down throughout the breadth of the clergy and the lay leaders all the way down to the seminaries and having executive development assessments and pathways for people. How do we pick? Uh, who leads where in our diocese. That could be uh, done in the way it's done now, or it could be done um, accounting for some incredible tools that much of the rest of the world has developed over years to align strengths and competencies with roles and responsibilities to make sure we have a really good alignment of these things and help with development paths for people to gain even more competencies and things. So, so there's a, a way in which much of the rest of the world takes advantage of this huge set of activities that represent alignment between institutional needs and challenges for which, which demand particular leadership skills and competencies, and then the skills and competencies of the executives that could possibly be in those roles, right on up through governance. Um, I became aware of this briefly when I uh, co-chaired a study on ethics in the Navy when I was serving on the Navy's policy advisory board, the U.S. Navy. And uh, one of the things we discovered is that if you were trained for 20 years as naval aviator, you were really, really good at being a naval aviator. I mean, these men and women land, you know, jets on a rocking postage stamp in the middle of the ocean at night, uh, among other things. It's extraordinary. But you, you're not trained necessarily for the greater issues of institutional leadership. So when you get 20 years into your career and all of a sudden your flying days are done and now you're a leader for the whole Navy or a bigger part of it, you've got to figure out uh, all these other executive competencies and skills and try to layer on quickly experiences and broader issues of institutional leadership rather than just the smaller ones of your career path through naval aviation. So it's very similar with, with our priests. And on the other hand, we have this constellation of hundreds, if not thousands, of very experienced, dedicated lay leaders who, who know institutional governance from the board level, from the strategic institution level, and everything on down, that want to help and can help. I have proposed that they help in more than an advisory capacity. Uh, I have proposed a model for uh, a, a diocese that would look a lot like having uh, minority independent directors on a board where the bishop is still in the chair and the clerics still have um, uh, a veto over control. But it's, but it's not just civilian advisors or lay advisors. It is um, lay members who actively have governance responsibility, even as independent minority members. They don't get involved in, in, in the theology. They don't get involved in the, um, in the real affairs, the ecclesiastical affairs. But boy, are they sure there to help in, the, in this uh, array 
of challenges that our church has had at the diocesan and above level and just dealing with the welter of issues that can come out of from being an institution in a largely secular society. So uh, for my part, just on the basis of getting more competencies and skills that were trained in an entirely different way and with an entirely different kind of life into the better service of our church, uh, I'm for a much more aggressive and, and uh, lay, lay role that's oriented in a fiduciary kind of way, not just an advisory kind of way at multiple levels in our church. So I'll stop, I'll stop there, Pia, and wait for a discussion.